my choice. Living with what you've done can be its own punishment. What happened to every character on Orange is the New Black? And what was the deeper moral in her endpoint? In part two of our Ending Explained, we're giving our take on where the show left off with Pensatucky, Cindy, Lorna, Maria, and Gloria. This video is brought to you by Surfshark, the only VPN that allows unlimited simultaneous connections. Right now, they're offering our viewers a limited time offer. Click the link in the description below, surfshark.deal slash the take to get 83% off a two year plan and enter the code the take to get three additional months of Surfshark for free. <music> Tiffany Pensatucky Doggett comes to embody the danger of hope. Since she first entered the show, p -Tuck made so much progress as a person, evolving from a confused, self-deluding antagonist to one of the most positive, likable characters. After a talented GED teacher observes that Doggett is dyslexic. I am not R-worded. No, you're not. Um, but I think that you might be dyslexic. Her arc in the final season seems like it's completing this empowering upward trajectory. I am the exception. I feel that I've gotten better since being here. Most people get worse. But that uplifting conclusion is not to be. Once again, Pensatucky is let down by an insensitive man. You were supposed to request more time for my dyslexia. Do you remember that? She even implies that Loosecheck is worse than the others who've heard her before. Let's no, because I've known some real pieces of shit in my life, but you, you're garbage. Forgetting to file paperwork to get her extra time on her GED test doesn't strike us as objectively worse than abuse doled out to her by a string of awful men, starting with the father who terrorized her by drilling in the idea that she's stupid. God damn, you're dumb. But this time, the letdown feels worse because she cared so much, because she got her hopes up. The test was a chance to prove to herself, finally, that she's not stupid. Do you know how hard I studied for that test? I studied my f***ing ass off. Do you know what you've done to me? When she believes she's failed, the hope that's been fueling her rushes out, leaving her empty and vulnerable to crushing despair. I don't need some test to tell me how stupid I am. She overdoses, even though she hasn't touched drugs in years, most likely intentionally. You think she did it on purpose? I don't know. Probably. Flashbacks in season three's Doggett episode also centered on a time when she got her hopes up. I love you too. And I'm coming back for you. So in both past and present, what puts her over the edge is getting a taste of a better life where she gets to feel good about herself. When this proves illusory, her learned bad habits and the voices inside her head putting her down come back more potent than ever. What can we learn from this? First of all, that if you're a person who's giving hope to someone who's not used to feeling it, you have a responsibility to follow through. Look, I'm here, okay? And ain't nobody else coming through that door. And not be just another disappointment. My GED teacher just up and quit on me. Apparently he has a sick grandmother in Illinois. You also have to be sensitive that what you say isn't necessarily what someone like Doggett hears. Should we start with the alphabet? No! See? No, I can read, stupid. People interpret all of our words and actions through the lens of their past experiences. When teachers want to help dog it, she assumes they're criticizing her. I told you I didn't want to take stupid tests, and now you're trying to tell me that I'm so stupid I can't even cheat, right? Likewise, her father's toxic behavior stems from his particular hurt and experiences. We glean from the flashbacks that he's probably dyslexic too. What kind of moron names your boat? Band Mass. What kind of anti-Catholic shit is that? It says Bass Man. And has internalized self-hatred as a result of his community's bullying. For those who can identify with Doggett's battle against feelings of worthlessness, the lesson is to try to keep hope alive without pinning it to one specific outcome. When her boyfriend has to leave, or she thinks she bombed the test, she shuts down and resigns herself to being trapped. But she doesn't have to give up on her whole life when a certain dream doesn't immediately come true. Positive experiences can arm us with the tools to be resilient, even when our goals take more time than we'd like. The tragic irony of P-Tuck's fate is that she did pass the GED, even without the extra time. What's so sad about her story is that it's clear she's a hilarious person with wicked intelligence, yet she can't bring herself to truly believe this. Pensatucky. 
Cindy Hayes' story is a study of avoidance. At first, the main thing we're likely to notice about Black Cindy is that she's funny. But her talent for humor and keeping it light are tactics and her strategy of dodging confrontation and difficult realities. And funny is like duct tape fixes everything. In earlier flashbacks, we've seen that Cindy is in denial of her responsibility as a mother. She left her daughter Monica with her own mother and became an intermittent presence, showing up only when she felt like it. I can do whatever I want with my own damn daughter. You lost all right to call her your daughter when you left her here with me. In the final two seasons, after betraying her best friend Tasty to protect herself in the aftermath of the riot, Cindy is literally crippled with guilt. She develops debilitating back pain that's her remorse and conscience physically manifesting in her body. Just as she can't escape this bodily reality, Cindy gradually realizes that she can't keep emotionally evading the things she's done. You need to forgive yourself for testifying against your girl. After she's released, Cindy returns to live with her mother and Monica, trying to build a positive life on the outside. But when Tasty gets her revenge with a letter exposing the truth about Monica's parentage, Cindy reverts to her old habits and runs off. You drop a bomb in the middle of my house and then run off? I thought you said you changed. I thought things would be different. She ends up hitting rock bottom and living on the street. And her turning point comes when another homeless woman says to her, The way I see it, if you made a person, you on the hook forever. This woman is speaking about her own parents, and at first we might think Cindy's hearing these words as saying her mother will have to forgive her. But in fact, this statement shocks Cindy into remembering that she's a mother, that she's on the hook, and running away won't change that. Because I made you, and I ain't ever been too good at keeping at something. But the woman who made me taught me better than that. Digging deeper, we can see that Cindy's pathological instinct for avoidance actually comes from low self-esteem. And the more she flees her responsibilities, the more she proves to herself that she's a bad person who deserves to suffer. But it doesn't matter what I do or, or how bad I want to change, all I ever end up doing is making things worse. Her betrayal of Tasty exacerbates this tendency. She views what she did to her best friend as beyond forgiveness. Since this is too terrible to face, she can only cope by continuing to avoid it. But Cindy's paralyzing self-hatred is still ultimately a form of selfishness. Self-centeredness has always been Cindy's problem, and her solution is to step outside of how she's feeling. Once she focuses on others' points of view, it becomes easier to stop obsessing about her own worthlessness and do right. She takes a small but concrete step towards being a reliable fixture in her family's life. But I'm still gonna be here, Monica. And I'm gonna prove to you that you can trust me, that the both of you can trust me. Every Sunday, 11 o'clock, Cindy can't fix what she's done wrong, especially not for Tasty. But her redemption is simply that she's present, no longer avoiding the truth. I want to tell you about your dad. And no longer avoiding her life. Because she kept after you. And she kept showing up. And I want to be like her. So I'm here. Meanwhile, another character makes the opposite choice. Lorna Morello represents running away from reality. Her season seven episode, The Heidi Hole, shows her attempting to literally outrun painful truths, both in her flashback and in the present at Litchfield. Lorna's problems with reality have been apparent ever since we found out in season two that her beloved Christopher was not her fiance, but a man she became obsessed with after just one date. She left notes on my car. She threw trash on my lawn. She left voicemails yelling about how I wasn't helping enough with the dog. I don't even have a dog. Actress Yael Stone said she believes the character suffers from mental illness, most likely erotomania, the delusion that someone is in love with her in spite of evidence to the contrary. Did she ever make an attempt on your life? Yes. She's being so dramatic. They're twisting this whole story. Lorna characterizes herself as someone who loves love. I deserve to be with somebody who loves love. She's romantic about romance. I am so, so happy for the both of you. And I only hope that one day 
I can find the kind of love that you two share together. This is combined with some level of psychosis. Lorna creates a beautiful alternate reality in her head and discards those ugly facts that don't fit. But the mystery of Lorna has always been to what extent she knows, deep down, that she's lying about her life. I just... I'm missing my fiance, Christopher, is all. She has moments where the truth breaks through to her and she acknowledges that something's wrong. I'm crazy. I'm a crazy person. There is something really wrong with me. Over time, Lorna seems to be overcoming her tendency to retreat into delusion. Christopher's confronting her in front of her friends at prison. I don't know this woman, okay? We went on one date. One. She's a Stalker. Helps her build an open, honest relationship with Nikki. At last, her dreams seem to finally come true when she marries Vinny, a man who knows and loves her, and she becomes a mother as she always wanted to be, even if the circumstances aren't exactly how she imagined it. It's just my mama bit instincts are raging to protect little Julius or Augustine. Or, I'm still workshopping the names. Well, weren't those the rat names? But then this dream is abruptly taken away with the premature delivery and the tragic death of their son Sterling. Lorna's instinct for self-deception reappears with a vengeance. I don't know where you're getting those photos, but it's not him. It's someone else's baby. Could you please stop saying that? Your baby is dead, Lorna. Not wanting to face the loss of a child is exactly how any parent would feel in this heartbreaking situation. I understand why you wouldn't want to accept what happened because that makes it real. And losing a child, I mean, that's the kind of pain that a lot of people never recover from. But as she resorts to creating a fake Instagram account for Sterling and refuses to engage honestly with her husband, who's also grieving, Lorna makes her choice to flee the reality she doesn't want for the fiction of her heart's desires. But I thought at least we could help each other to get through this. Well, you didn't leave the baby with my sister Franny, did you? Because, you know, this one time I saw she let my nephew teeth on a back of a cigarette. The temptation is to assume Lorna is like any other person who knows they're lying. Well, when I look at you, I and mean, really look at you, I can see that a part of you knows. And many people's first instinct might be to reason with someone like Lorna, to force her to see the facts. Because it's the truth. All right, you have to start accepting the truth. But this isn't effective. Lorna's delusion is too powerful and fixed to be brought down with logic. Whenever Lorna is confronted with a painful event, a strange look comes over her face. It's like we can see something splinter in her mind. And the flashback reveals that in moments like these, Lorna actually blacks out. I can't remember anything. Her mind is blocking out the trauma, which threatens to puncture the beautiful balloon that is her romantic dream of her life. As Lorna runs out of the prison into the sunlight at the end of Heidi Hole, it's a visualization of her attempt to escape into unreality. It's important not to minimize that, like a number of characters, Lorna should be getting medical help for her mental illness. She needs more help than you and me can give her. But to a lesser extent, we all face the temptation to dress up the truth to make it more palatable. Many of us might think a pair of rose-colored glasses isn't the worst way to cope when life doesn't live up to the fairy tale. Ultimately though, Lorna's choice of unreality leaves her in a state of isolation and mental deterioration. I want to be with you, but if you can live in reality, then maybe we should get a divorce. Do you hear what I just said? So her story underlines that the more you feed the lie, the more that lie will grow, pushing out everything else of value. Until holding on to this big, grotesque fabrication is incompatible with sustaining a real life, and you have nothing left but the lie. I'm writing to my baby. The father's keeping him away from me. Gloria Mendoza's story underlines the difficulty of knowing what's best for your family's future. Yo tuve que irme para buscar una oportunidad. Y ahora... No, no tenías que irte. Esa fue tu decisión. Wanting a better life for her kids, Gloria moves away from her daughters in Puerto Rico to make money and bring them opportunities in the U.S. She ends up taking a longer path, which she believes will yield greater rewards. But by the time she's ready for her daughters to join her, they feel she missed being their mom during the years they needed her. No vamos, Gloria. Sí, sí vienen, Ceci. Tú no te mandas. 
Yo soy tu madre. ¿Desde cuándo? Most parents face a similar struggle to some degree. Is it better to be present with your family or make sacrifices to better their situation even if they won't understand? Yo estoy aquí haciendo todo lo posible para ustedes. Given that Gloria ends up in prison, her story captures that our plans we make rarely turn out as we hoped. It's impossible to predict what will happen, so counting on a rigid vision for your family's future can be a dangerous gamble. Near the end, Gloria tries to make up for losing her daughters by helping other separated families connect. I think you should let your boys know. <sighs> Thank you. Just hurry up. This choice directly threatens her goal of rejoining her own sons via her imminent release. So her arc in this season highlights that eternal conflict parents face between doing right by their own kids versus doing what's right for everybody's kids. But I was stupid helping those women talk to their families instead of putting mine first. I should have been a selfish prick. The idealistic answer to this dilemma is that being a good person helps make the world better, which is what your family needs too. But no matter how good your reason is, a kid can't understand why her mother isn't there. Los niños no saben nada de, 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 de barrios buenos, escuelas seguras, nada de eso. Ellos quieren estar con su mamá. Bueno, ¿de qué sirvo yo si no es para darle una vida mejor? Gloria is saved from her terrible dilemma by Luzchek finally doing one good thing and taking the fall for her. I know how the phones are getting in. I, I, I bring them in. It's me. While Gloria may get her much delayed happy ending, she embodies these impossible choices that come with being a mother. The best thing we can learn from her story is to do our best in the present without getting too many steps ahead of ourselves or chasing after a future time that may never come. Maria Ruiz demonstrates the power of taking responsibility for what you've done. After no small number of twists and turns in her outlook. We got pregnant Maria, gangbanger Maria, Jesus saves Maria, whatever weird cult this is Maria. As Maria nears the end of the series, she's viewing herself as a victim. I am the victim. She believes that whatever she's done wrong pales in comparison to how much she's paid for it. I should write myself a letter. Dear self, sorry everyone in your life's been shit. And her crimes didn't even have individual victims who suffered meaningfully. All I did was sell some bitches a few fake clothes. They wanted brand names. I gave them brand names, so who's the victim there? Gucci? F*** a Gucci. But regardless of whether her punishments fit her sins, she comes to realize that her actions have hurt people. I got greedy, and I made the wrong choice, and I screwed up our life. In the end, Maria embodies why it's crucial to stop blaming the world, take stock of choices we regret, and look maturely at how we've hurt others. Restorative justice can help us understand why we did what we did. It can help us feel the effects of our actions on the people we may have hurt. Once she does these things, her situation immediately improves. Her ex brings her daughter to visit her so she can build a relationship with her child which is what she wants most of all. And I may be a criminal and a piece of shit and all that, but I love my baby. I stay alive for my baby. So instead of dwelling on our grievances, as soon as we own our mistakes, we just might find that this action alone turns things around for the better. Stay tuned for our next video looking at Red, Suzanne, Nikki, and where the rest of the ladies ended up. And prison is just not as romantic as all those 70s exploitation movies made it seem. I want my money back. This video is brought to you by Surfshark, an award-winning VPN that makes protecting your online privacy easier than ever. The average person spends more than six hours a day online. That means the internet knows a lot about you. So if you want to safeguard your personal information and stop getting targeted ads, you need to start using a secure VPN. Surfshark encrypts all your internet traffic and hides your IP address to keep your online activity, passwords, and credit card details totally private. Plus, you can use it to access TV shows or movies on any streaming platform in the world, giving you a whole new slate of content to check out. Right now, they're offering a special deal to our viewers. Click the link in the description below, surfshark.deal slash the take to get 83% off a two-year plan. If you enter the code the take, you'll also get three additional months of Surfshark for free.